Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Alana McGovern Register, and I'm the curator here at Silver Plume Exhibitions. Stop this share here. All right, we are super excited to have Gary Staub with us to tell us a little bit about his career as a paleo sculptor. We have been working with Gary for many years and his work is featured in every exhibition that we have built and toured. Um, behind me, you will see the latest work that Gary has done for us. This is a beautiful dodo that will be the centerpiece of the upcoming exhibition called Exploring Extinction, the Dodo. We expect to launch in summer of 2020. And you can check our website, spexhibitions.com for um, more information on that and when it might be in your neighborhood. So uh, today, Gary will be uh, teaching us how to sculpt a sauropod dinosaur. So gather your clay and your sculpting materials. And um, you will also need this piece of paper, which is called a bone map. And you can uh, find a printable PDF of this on our website, spexhibitions.com under the additional programming tab. So you can get those supplies together while Gary gives us a little background on some of the amazing works he's created. Um, for those of you joining us live, you can ask questions um, using the Q&A button on Zoom and the chat feed on YouTube Live. And I will relay your questions to Gary at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, thank you, Gary, for joining us. And I will let you take it from here. Thanks, Alana. Uh, what I'd like to do initially is I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, the process of, of restoring prehistoric animals, uh, the life appearance of prehistoric animals for museums, and kind of walk you through some of the different examples of projects that I've worked on. And so I'm going to screen share this um, and open up some images. There we go. So. My job uh, is I well I'm first off I just I must mention I'm a pretty lucky lucky guy because I get to to work on uh, sculptures for museums and most of the time that that job involves creating sculptures like dinosaurs for natural history museums and these as you can see uh, can be really exciting and large scale projects to work on um, not only do I get to work on dinosaurs, but I also get to make really small things tall. So big versions of small uh, things like insects, the, these are leafcutter ants. And also uh, some of the largest versions of things that ever flew, swam, or, or walked uh, the earth. And uh, this is the, the sculpture that Alana mentioned before, this, the, uh, dodo sculpture that I just finished and that was a really it was kind of on my bucket list of sculpture projects to work on so it was really nice to be able to work with them and and uh, see that one all the way through. So this is a project that I worked on uh, for the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. It's a life-size Camarasaurus and our subject today is going to looks a lot like Camarasaurus. So uh, it's a long neck, long tailed animal called a sauropod. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the anatomy of it and, and kind of how, what the mechanics of a big animal like that are and how, what kind of lifestyle it probably led. The sculptures that I work on can be made in everything from that, like the previous image, that Camarasaurus, which is a, a kind of resin, a plastic, to, to life-size bronze sculptures. This is a life-size Colombian mammoth for the Omaha Zoo in Omaha, Nebraska. Not only do I work on uh, paleontological subjects, I also get to work on archeological subjects as well. And this is a site uh, in Italy, uh, Pompeii. So this is Mount Vesuvius erupts in 79 AD and then completely entombs the, the surrounding towns. And the, the skeletons of the people are actually inside of those uh, plaster casts. And because they're so fragile, my job is to replicate those in the most accurate way possible so that they can travel in an exhibition and they're currently now on tour. I made five of those figures for an exhibit called Pompeii. And that's one of the final figures. 
they also get to work on forensic reconstruction. So if a scientist wants to know what a person looked like after they died, uh, they hand me their skull and then I use these little pegs, which are, are uh, average tissue uh, measurements, add those on and then sculpt in the muscles. And that gives me a very good idea of what the, what the face looked like. And that's the final result of it cast in a translucent material and then painted and then all the individual hair is inserted. When we don't have those skin, those averages for the skin depth tissue, um, it has to be a muscle by muscle approach. And so this is the technique that I used when I was recreating the uh, restoration of Lucy, which you can see uh, at the Houston Museum of Sciences and then also of Natural Sciences and then also at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And then this is a project we just finished up. Uh, it's the largest shark that ever swam. It's Megalodon, it's a 52 foot long. My team and I work with, when you see these big projects and then it takes a lot of people, a lot of hands to work on these. I don't do them all by myself. Um, and, and it takes many months to build these big sculptures. And this was one that we installed earlier this year. And you, if you ever get a chance to go to DC to the National Museum of Natural History, you can see this one on display. So artists have been making sculptures of animals for a really long time. In fact, some of the earliest art uh, is of animals. This is, this is a, a site in Alt, called Altamira in Spain, 26,000 year old um, paintings of animals. Now, what's kind of interesting to think about is that when you think about how people represent things and artists generally, there's an advantage to uh, artists having a real distinctive style. Well, for me, it's actually a disadvantage to have a style. I want to disappear. So if I have a, such a strong style, if I have a, a style um, like Picasso's, for instance, here, um, it actually works against me in the believability of portraying animals. I want to disappear. I, we don't want to see the artist's hand involved in making these animals. They want to be, we want them to, to be first and foremost. So I get lucky, I'm lucky enough to go out into the field uh, and help dig up dinosaurs. And so I work as a research associate at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And so I get to go out in the field with them and help uh, uh, actually, actually excavate dinosaur bones as, as often as I can, can manage it. So how do you start? I mean, this is the big question we're gonna answer today. We're gonna try and answer today, right? Is how do you start to build a dinosaur? Well, you have to start with what we have and those are the fossils, right? So we, we start by uh, a, a uh, piece by piece approach and sometimes the uh, fossils are really complete and some most of the time they are not. Now, if we're really lucky, we have something like this. This is an animal called Utyrannus and it was found in China. And this is an animal that is, is very, very complete. You can see almost every single bone represented. And I was commissioned by the, a museum in Miami to recreate this animal. I'm kind of going to walk you through the process, starting with the skeleton and show you exactly how that, what that process looks like. Look at the, just the, the exquisite preservation of this. This, you know, down to the serrations of the teeth. It's a really beautiful, um, fossil, of course, it's really squashed. A lot of these things get compressed and they get squished to one side or the other. So those are the things that you really have to consider when you're looking at a, a fossil. Sometimes they get a little mashed and squashed, a little bit roadkill looking, and you have to be able to try and, um, un, you have to uh, kind of inflate, the, inflate those forms so that you, we can think of them as they were in life. Now what's neat, sometimes you get this, uh, you get preservation of soft tissues and in particular, in, on this animal, Utyrannus, there are actually feather impressions right along the entire outside margin of this animal. And so the client was, um, uh, and I and the scientists uh, went into a big discussion about how we were going to portray that and uh, came up with uh, what, what was going to be um, the approximation of what this animal looked like. Now, this is a 27 foot long animal. And it starts by making a small scale sculpture. We use uh, a laser to, to scan it, break it into sections, and then we can mill those sections in foam and then piece it together over a steel armature because one of the requirements of doing this is that it all has to fit through a door, right? So it has to be able to come apart and then we have to be able to put it back together. Um, but it, uh, So that's the, the biggest, that's to get in a, we have to put it in a truck and then we have to get it to the place that it needs to go. Now, one of the tricky uh, parts after you get the foam 
uh, done is you want to be able to, to recreate the, um, the soft tissues that are exposed on this. And so what I do is I'll put over these areas that are going to be exposed, I'll take an oil-based clay, I'll sculpt that clay over the top of it, and then I'll, then I'll put in the individual uh, scale detail from that. And that clay doesn't ever harden. Uh, we make a mold of that and then cast it in the final material. Now, the strange thing that we talked about earlier, right, is so most people, when they think about dinosaurs, they don't think about feathers. But uh, this one has the feathers preserved um, all around the body. And so we ended, ended up making over 250,000 individual feathers that we then hand glued, my team and I hand glued over this entire thing. You can see how it's broken into pieces and then it gets put back together. And then that's the final product. So our, our animal today, uh, Camarasaurus looks a lot, a lot like, or our animal today, Jabaria, looks a lot like Camarasaurus, excuse me. And, and so the same, same idea. So let's take a look at some of these forms uh, on Camarasaurus. It's got a thing, that we're gonna talk about this really big round belly. Um, that's really important for a lot of things and we'll talk more in depth about it as we start sculpting. And I made this also for the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. This gives you a little idea of sort of the logistics of being able to put these things together and then drop them into position. And there's my kids hanging out underneath the, the Camarasaurus. And then it's, it's a counterpart of Ceratosaurus that looks much, much smaller, even though it's 17 feet long. All right, so let's do some sculpting. This is the best part. Um, so we can do, I'm gonna stop the screen share here, and then we're gonna work back to our, there we go, is that, all right, we're gonna move down here so that we have, I'm gonna focus this down now. So this animal, Jabaria, was found by Dr. Paul Serino in the Sahara Desert with his team and they dug it up. And you can see all the bones that are represented on the skeleton. That's a big, big animal. So this is over 60 feet long. And um, as we start today, you, you might wanna get like a screen or a sheet protector like this that you can put over that piece of paper so that the ink doesn't run on the table when we get it wet with clay. Um, if you don't have that, you can just take some packing tape and just tape it across like that. That works really well to, to, to uh, keep the drawing intact. Now and you can use a lot of any kind of clay that you have for this. Now I'm, you can use air dry clay, DOS is a great clay. Um, you can use um, modeling clay, which is oil-based clay. Uh, so whatever, whatever you have, in a pinch, you can use um, uh, some of the Play-Dohs, but they're, they tend to move a lot, so that can be a little bit frustrating to work with. But what I'm going to do right now is we're going to just kind of walk you through and talk about the, the process. So today I'm going to be using some, some water-based clay. And uh, what, I, what I'd like you to do is first start out with something that's about the, the size of a uh, size of an orange, a decent size orange, right? So we're, that's about the size of clay we're going to start with. We're not going to use that for, uh, uh, we'll use elements of it for, we're going to build individual shapes first, join them together, and then we'll stand it up uh, as we get a little bit further in. So the first shape that we're going to make um, is kind of a chicken. We're going to go for sort of a chicken egg. And what I want you to do is so cut off about a chicken egg size out of your off of your orange. And I want you to kind of roll it. You can roll it in your hands. Now it's nice to use the table if you can. Now be kind to your parents when you're working on this and uh, get a piece of plastic or, or, uh, um, or make sure you clean up well after, but you can roll that on the table and then you're gonna come up with something that looks a little bit, it's kind of an oval shape, something like that. Now our goal here is we're going to put it over the top. This is going to be our torso for our for our Jabaria. Now Jabaria is a really cool name because it is actually named from the Touareg people who are in the Sahara when they where they found it. Now that was their bone. That was their name for the bones that they saw in the desert. And they could they didn't they didn't honestly know what they were, but they they called them Jabar generically. Um, and so Paul Serena thought that would be a really nice nod. Uh, to that, to their, to the Tuaregs acknowledgement of those bones well before anyone else had ever discovered them. So, um, so he called this animal Jobario. So, uh, so 
So we're looking at this chicken, chicken egg form. Now, um, sauropods uh, are herbivores. And what's fun to think about is uh, what an herbivore's rib cage looks like versus a carnivore. Now, a classic example of a carnivore would be uh, a lion or something like that. Well, if you look, if you look straight um, down the, 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 the eyes of a, of a carnivore, they're very narrow because they have a high, they, what they eat has a lot of caloric value, right? So they get a lot of energy, they're meat eaters. So they're eating, they're getting a lot of calories and it's to their advantage to be slim, to be able to chase down these, these animals. Now, Jobaria has to, is, is, his teeth are set up to eat uh, plants. And so we're gonna, we're gonna use a, a nice big rib cage because it has to hold, it has to have a really big gut and it has to have a big stomach that, you, that processes as much energy as it can out of the plants, which don't have per bulk as, uh, as many calories as meat do, uh, does, excuse me. So there's, that's the first step. So chicken egg, hopefully that's done. And then we're gonna move on to the legs. Now, what I'd like you to do is take, grab a piece from the orange. We're gonna make uh, a coil. So this can be a calm. Now animals um, that have a lot of weight to them like this, uh, their legs are what they call kind of columnar. And so what we wanna do is kind of roll out uh, some clay about like that, a little bit more. And then we're gonna, we really wanna pay attention. We wanna stay inside of the lines of the skeletal diagram. And we're gonna work with the front leg first. And I want you to take that, take that coil like that. We're gonna flatten it on the bottom like that. We're gonna hold it over the top of the skeletal drawing. We're gonna bend it at the wrist and then back at the elbow and then over the top of the shoulder, then you're gonna cut off this part, put it back with the rest of the orange. And then we're gonna blend that, that leg onto the rest of the, of the uh, chicken egg sized oval that we have. So that's our first start. Now, I'm gonna pick this up and put it down a lot. It's to your advantage to leave it on uh, the diagram because what will happen is it gets can get fragile. The more you work with it, the more fragile it will become. So uh, one of the other things that's really important is to be able to blend that clay onto the body and that's gonna give you strength. And as we move it around, I will, uh, we're gonna make sure uh, that our, our dinosaurs don't fall apart and it stays nice and strong uh, throughout. You'll find out how important that is a little bit later. Now, same idea for the back leg. We're gonna uh, roll out a coil. You can roll it on the plastic or on the table, whatever works. We're gonna flatten it on the bottom like that. And then we're gonna bend it at the ankle and then back at the knee like that. And then up at the shoulder. We wanna make sure that it stays within the proportions of this really nice um, bone map that we have, which is your basic blueprint for the animal. Take off any of the excess, we're gonna blend that. And then all of a sudden you have this thing and you can't tell which way it's going here or there, uh, but back and forward. All right, look at that. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the same shape that we use to create the legs, but we're gonna use it to create the tail. Now, same idea, uh, rolling a coil out. Now, but what, what we can do with this to make it the tail, you see obviously it's very thick at the base and then it gets a little bit thinner as we move down here, is push a little bit harder on one side. And then you go ahead and, and then pull it out into that shape. So it's, it's kind of like a, a stretched out ice cream cone. Uh, and that works, works pretty well. Now we're gonna use that. We're gonna start at the tip. And we're gonna lay that on the diagram, make sure it matches cut off the excess like that, and then squish it on to the tail like that. And so all of a sudden our sauropod has a tail. And then make sure you adjust it as you go. Now, we, um, Alana, uh, we talked about the different possible tools you could use that you might have laying around the house. So a tongue depressor or, tongue, uh, uh, or popsicle stick work great for this. Uh, a toothpick is also sort of helpful. So um, you can use the this uh, tongue depressor or popsicle stick as a sculpting tool and you can use that to help uh, refine the outside line of the animal. 
and then go around and mix. It's always nice to be able to check um, as you go the line of the animal so that it stays accurate to, uh, it's easy, easy to lose your way. And, uh, and the thing is, is don't worry about, um, don't worry about if it doesn't work out right away because you can just squish it, squish up that part and start over. I do that all the time. I, I never make anything, you know, right the first time. I'm always, I have to work pretty hard. Um, there's a lot of artists who are super good and uh, at getting things right um, off of the bat, but uh, I have to work pretty hard at it. I'm not as natural as most people at this. So, uh, so there we are. So look, we'll hold this up if we can. And now our Jabaria has the tail and then we're gonna go ahead and move on to, we're gonna move on to the, to the head and neck. Same idea once again, using the clay from this decreasingly size, <laughs> decreasing orange uh, and we'll make another coil like that. Now we'll see if this is the right size or not. That's fairly close. And so we'll push this there, there, and then go ahead and blend. Looks like I didn't get enough in this throat area. The trachea and esophagus on sauropods makes up a really interesting shape. Uh, I've done some anatomical, I've done some dissection work on, um, on living animals to try and, well, they're deceased animals, but they're extant animals, animals that are around today to, uh, to look at these structures and see how they compare to, to the fossil forms. And sauropod dinosaurs have a really interesting um, transition as it goes into the, to the rib cage here. So we wanna make sure that there's, there's enough um, physical structure for this to hold up. Um, and so I've added just a little bit more clay on that throat area. So I'm going to do that. There we already that makes sense there. Now you can see I'm a little bit long on my limbs. So I may, I may refine those as we move on. It's also probably because I'm doing it upside down, but um, never, never feel, uh, as I said, don't, don't be afraid of, of going back in and reworking things. And you can use these tools, you can use the toothpick. One other way, if you, if you only have one of these tools, if you wanna make it a, a more refined tool, is you just take it and you twist it. And what you can do is it allows you to make um, a bunch of smaller tools. So you can have like a really refined little thing if you wanted to do some skin folds or some little, uh, some little details. All right, so now we have one side of the sauropod basically roughed out. And then what I'd like you to do is go ahead and, and roll that. We're gonna peel it off of, this is where the plastic comes in pretty handy. If you have paper, it's gonna to stick to it pretty hard. And now look, look at the backside here. You can see where I've joined. What I would, I'd like you to do is stick your finger and go ahead and blend these areas. That's gonna make our dinosaur a lot stronger and it's gonna make it so his head doesn't fall off which is never ideal in the grand scheme of things. You wanna be able to make sure everything joins up and is very strong. So where those legs join, I'm gonna, I'm gonna squish that in. And then also I can take a tool and blend those areas as well. So that makes sense. All right, great. Next thing, uh, I'm gonna, gonna flip this around we're gonna look at it this way. What I'd like you to do is go ahead and then make, just like you did on the first side, we're gonna make the front leg and then we're gonna repeat and do the back leg as well. So grabbing a little bit more clay, making another coil, roll that out. I'm gonna echo the shape flat on bottom, bend at the wrist, bend at the elbow, and then pushing it into the shoulder. Same idea for the, for the back leg. Take the remainder of the, or another bit of a coil. Roll it out. Flat on the bottom, bend at the ankle. 
bend at the knee, and then push that onto the, onto the hip area. Now this is a time where you can, you can really start to uh, refine some of the shapes, um, make sure the transitions are, um, make sense. Now, a great, a great thing to look at at this point, also when it comes to posing your animal, which we're about to do, is there's, a, there's some really great references. Some of the best living animals to look at uh, for these really heavy bodied animals are elephants. And one of the references that I like to use is this book by a guy called Muybridge. And he has taken these beautiful photographs of sequences of this animal, of, of a lot of different animals walking. And he uses, and you can use these as an artist to, to great effect. They're, they're really beautiful uh, studies in movement. They're very valuable when you're trying to figure out a pose for your animal. Um, very inspirational. Now, granted, sauropods are, aren't exactly what elephants are. You know, we have uh, sore pods have long, long necks, long tails. They're working with different, different set of physics, uh, uh, physical challenges because of those things. But uh, elephants are really one of the best things we have to look at. So they, they, they are very heavy animals, and they deal certainly do deal with some of the same, um, uh, same issues as far as gathering food. And uh, and locomotion. So this is a this is a great reference. You can look you can look this Google this, um, Muy Bridge uh, or Animal Motion, um, and this is a great reference to use. Now, if you happen to have a piece of cardboard, um, just a, something out of this out of the recycle bin, uh, this is a good time. We're going to take we're going to uh, start thinking about the po potential pose for our. Uh, animal or jabaria, and there's a lot of different a lot of different things we can do with this. Now, sometimes it makes sense to uh, go ahead and like if you want to, you can do the most basic pose, and and you could be done, right? So, I, you know, I'm I'm super happy with this. I think I'm going to leave it or you can take it as far as you like. So uh, we can think about maybe uh, a, a walking pose. We could move this leg forward, bring this all backwards. Uh, it's hard to see. So this leg back and uh, doing alternating walking cycle. Now animal locomotion is very complex. And so it's, it's neat to, as I said, take advantage of those visual cues that you get from uh, people who've done really good photography, watch videos, watch reference. You really can only be as good as your reference when you're building these animals. Um, and it, it's in the, as you build knowledge of the animals, you'll start to see things repeated over and over in form. Um, and it's a really fun, fun way to kind of look at the world and start seeing thing, this, uh, these commonalities that are repeated over and over. So, um, so we could put one, one neat thing to be able to include uh, in your sculpture is an S shape. S, S shapes are really uh, appealing forms in nature and sauropods have them like mad. They're, they, uh, you can do a lot of cool, uh, can do a lot of cool shapes uh, with sauropods because they're sort of walking uh, S curves. Uh, so we can do that uh, within the tail. They probably had a high, high degree of nobility in the tail. You can do a walking pose like this uh, conceivably, the other, the other possibility is that you could take it and do sort of a rearing pose um, like I showed in some of the others. So that's a more tripodal pose. It's a lot more uh, dramatic pose. Um, and you could uh, move the legs underneath the body like this and like this. And then you could move the legs down and then have it something like this. So it's like maybe it's going up to eat some, eat some, uh, some vegetation or knock down a tree, something like that. So, all right, so we're gonna pick our pose. This is, we're gonna, we're gonna stick with the rearing pose because that's the one we ended up with last. And uh, now of course our, our animal, our Jabaria has to 
Uh, he has to be able to eat, of course, so we need to give him a mouth and then we need to, he has to be able to, he has to see and, 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 and uh, hear and breathe and all that good stuff. So we're gonna work uh, on a few of the, of the quick details of the head. So the, the neat thing about, we're gonna, I'm gonna move this over and we're gonna take a little bit of a cast of a sauropod skull right here. Um, this happens to be an animal, Camarasaurus. Now let's look at, let's look at this Camarasaurus. And uh, so the nasal opening is right here. So it has this little thin uh, bridge of bone on its nose. Um, and there's, <clears throat> there are definitely uh, differing opinions about the nasal position, but there's a couple of really good papers out by Larry Whitmer um, that show uh, what the approximate position of this, this it, where the where the nose would actually be within this big space, and most of it, uh, his his paper shows that that would most likely be um, right right about here. So towards crowded towards the the, the front end. So we're going to give it a nose about right here after we've kind of pinched that that little curve in there. This is uh, hard to know exactly what how much flesh goes over this area, but we have to look at uh, living animals as possible analogs for how that would kind of look, right? So. We're going to put a nose in there. We'll give it a mouth. So this is this is the line. These are the the teeth that I talked about. Um, they're they're very they they look like little spoons basically, and they're not for grinding whatsoever. They're basically for just raking um, raking uh, vegetation off and bolting it down in in large rough quantities. So we're gonna we have to give it a mouth opening. So we're gonna take our our very uh, high dollar sculpture tool, this uh, cocktail toothpick, and we're gonna we're gonna give it a mouth just like that. Do that. All right. Let's see if that's making any sense. We'll... There we go. Now the other part, uh, dinosaurs do have ears, believe it or not, but they're probably a lot like um, uh, bird ears or lizard ears. And so right behind this structure here, this is there's a muscle that runs from the lower jaw to the top um, of the, the skull here. And then the ear was located right behind that. So we're gonna go ahead and put that shape. And it probably had, it was more of an inset ear um, and probably looked something like you'd see on a chicken um, or uh, a turtle, uh, something like that, that has an enclosed, uh, has a tympanic membrane. It's kind of a drum that covers that area. So they, these uh, animals, I would, I would imagine were probably very dependent on um, being able to hear. They probably were like elephants and that they made really um, deep, um, deep sounds that could be heard over long distances. That would be my guess. There's no evidence for that, but um, animals this large, uh, I'm, I'm sure probably had some, some level of vocalization that they were uh, involved in. You can see I'm just refining the thickness. I'm taking a little bit of the weight off of off of the, the legs because as I see things, as I said, I always change them. Um, so we have a way to breathe. We have a way to eat. We have a way to hear. The thing we're missing is a way to see. Now, if you happen to have a, um, uh, I, I'm using just a, some little beads. So this is just a little um, tiny bead that I had. And uh, you can use just about anything. Uh, you don't even really need a bead, but I'm gonna use it for this particular demonstration. So I just pushed it really hard into my finger and then I'm gonna put it right there. And so it's ready to go. Um, now on this, if you look at the skull itself, so there's all these, all these different openings, which I, the, the Italian name for these openings is fenestre. So, so that means, that means it means window. So it's a window in the skull. And this particular, uh, the spot on sauropods where it goes is right here. So it's this, the eye goes right in that spot, that opening. So nose right here, there's another opening, there's another opening, but then this is the spot where the, where the eye goes. Now, this is the, the point where you can spend a lot of time refining, well, better put two eyes in there. It will look kind of funny, wouldn't it? And I'll put the other side on. And we're doing this all very quickly because I want to be able to give you, kind of show you the, the path to get there, but you could take the entire day or days uh, or weeks even making a sculpture like this. Um, and I sometimes do 
for that. It just depends. So right now we're going to, I'm gonna allow you can, we can take this a little bit further, um, but I'm just gonna show you, uh, this is something that I've spent a few, this is just using an air dry clay. So this is a, a sculpt of um, Jobaria that I made um, previous to this, just to give you a sense of how far you can take it if you really want to. Um, and, uh, but you can be completely done at this point if you like. Okay. And if you're using an air dry clay, then you can go ahead and paint it um, after it dries. But I would keep it on this little piece of cardboard uh, and just put it off, off to the side somewhere and let it dry. And then, um, uh, because if you leave it on a table, it can actually kind of stain the table with the, with the water as it dries out. And uh, that'll, that will, uh, I think your parents will like you better um, if, uh, if you do that. So anyway, well, thank, thank you for the opportunity to show you how to make a sauropod dinosaur. And I think at this point, if any, I don't know if anyone has any questions about this process, we'd love to. Hi, Gary. Yeah, thanks. Um, we have a couple questions. First, I'll show you. There's my <laughs> little sculpture. It was very fun. Thank you. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can type them into your, um, either using the uh, Zoom feature or on YouTube Live. Um, we do have one question uh, here. So uh, we saw that you put feathers onto the full uh, Tyrannosaurid. That was amazing. But we also noticed that you do uh, some feather or fur type creatures in say bronze or in clay and you don't actually add the feathers. What kind of tools or procedure do you use to um, sculpt that kind of texture into yeah. your finished pieces that aren't actually feathered? <laughs> it's a, it's a uh, can be a real challenge to, to sculpt because um, you're using essentially dirt to create feathers, you know, so clay, I mean, clay is, is, really fine dirt that has oil and wax added to it. So it can be, it's one of my greatest challenges. I'm working on right now a Sandhill Crane um, uh, right over there. So that um, I'm just starting to work on the feather detail. So I work on the forms first and then uh, at that, after I'm happy with the forms, then I'll work on uh, sculpting in the details. and. The, uh, let me grab some tools that I use uh, when I'm sculpting the, uh, excuse me for just 20 seconds. All right. So here's two of my favorite uh, sculpting tools. Um, both, both of these are, uh, or, or wire loops uh, and they have a serrated side here, kind of like a steak knife on one side. So they're, they have little grooves in them and then they're smooth on the other side. Um, and they're, they're a variety of, these are two really versatile shapes um, and you can get, get these really big um, mammoth size literally, or you can get them in really small, small forms. And these are actually my, these, I can do just about anything with these tools. Um, these shapes tend to be really versatile and you really just have to look at the texture that you're trying to replicate and then you can use this tool to outline it first and then do the geometry inside of it. So there's no, unfortunately, there's no easy trick to it. Uh, you just have to really do the, do the work and, and create those shapes and then sculpt, in, sculpt the outside and then do the inside form as well. Well, that is great. Um... So we have a couple uh, students here who were um, helping or were following along and they want to show you their pieces. So here are two sculptures. They added riders. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So you can make it your own world. It's very fun. So there yep. are two pieces by my two nephews that were following along. So I think excellent. they had a lot of fun with this. So Good. you have your rearing pose and then you have your standard standing pose. So 
Thank you so much, Gary. This was really a ton of fun. And um, yeah, I think we're, uh, no other questions right now. So okay, I think we'll, we'll sign off. Um, so for everyone that is following along at home, let me just share this last screen. So thank you so much for uh, joining us. And uh, if you wanna post your photos of your own works, um, you can uh, go ahead and do that with the hashtag SaurapodSculpt. And um, we will have this recorded. Um, so if you wanna, if you missed anything or need a little more time to follow along, you can uh, check it out again on our uh, website, spexhibitions.com. So um, also stay tuned for uh, some future artists. We're gonna have some more programming coming up in the weeks and months to come. So thank you so much, Gary. This was really a ton of fun. My, my pleasure. Thanks, Alana and Nick. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.